Now we're going to move to um, a discussion about the, the mining industry and uh, looking back at the past cycle, looking ahead to the next cycle, um, some of the challenges that might be out there. And I'm joined on stage by uh, Richard Ackerson. He's the chief executive of Freeport McMoran, which is the world's uh, biggest independently listed copper company. And next to him we have uh, Robert Friedland, who has a very extensive CV. Uh, he's currently the, the founder of Ivanhoe Mines and the executive chairman, but he's probably best known uh, for discovering some of the biggest deposits, I think, in the mining industry over his 30-year career. So um, I'd like to welcome you both to the stage. Um, if we could, the theme of this summit is about a new cycle, but I'd just like to start by talking about the past cycle. Um, it strikes me that we had this commodity super cycle huge demand from China, yet the industry probably didn't produce the sort of stellar returns that it perhaps could have done. There were lots of overambitious projects, there were lots of you know, wild acquisitions. Um, Richard, if I could just start with you, I mean, Freeport was hit pretty hard during the downturn of sort of 14, 15. You were forced to sell your, your oil and gas uh, uh, division, which was, you know, a, a deal, I think, when you actually bought that that you were never particularly happy with, but also the, the 10K mine. I just wonder, um, the experiences that Freeport went through, what are the lessons that you've learned from that? And what are you taking forward into the company strategy now in terms of you know, how, how much leverage can a, a mining company have that is you know, obviously very geared to cyclical sort of pricing? So just pinpoint a couple of dates. I joined Freeport the year after the Grassberg was discovered in 1989, so about a 30-year period there. And our company did a great job of taking that asset where we had been operating for a number of years on a relatively small scale and developing it on a fast, fast expansion. We went from discovery in 89 to ba basically being at our current level of productive capacity in seven or eight years. Uh, we lived through the challenges in Indonesia when Suharto stepped down in the midst of the Asian financial crisis. I became CEO in 2003. Uh, <clears throat> at that point, the price of copper was, you know, had risen to 70 cents a pound. No one in the industry that was running copper producing companies expected the price to go to a dollar in the foreseeable future, and the price, you know, went to four dollars pretty quickly. Um, and so, uh, you know, we did a great job at that time of holding our company together, repaying our debt. Uh, we lived through the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, after making the Phelps Dodge deal in 2007, 11 years ago, where we took on, we went from zero debt to, to $18 billion of debt. We managed that well. I guess the... There are lots of things, and we'll talk more about them. You know, we made a very bad deal with the oil and gas deal that a number of our directors were pushing. Other companies have made bad deals, so the idea is, you know, these some of these uh, notions that are driven about strategic moves to do certain things at certain time can really lead you to, to making deals in hindsight that are very bad. Um, Learned a real an alarm bell, isn't it? When, when I right. hear that word, strategic deal, it always you know, the Phelps Dodge deal wasn't a strategic deal for us. It was an opportunistic deal. And when I, I think you're much better off to do things on an opportunistic basis than having some board say, we want to make a move into a certain area, like aluminum or oil and gas at a certain time, and you go out and do a deal and things change. Um, Learn the real lesson of leverage. You know, our company over leveraged a couple of times in the 1990s by paying too high a dividend. Uh, we bought back a third of our stock in the late 1990s when our stock price broke. And trying to come out of that is, uh, you know, you're making a bet that things are going to get better and they don't, they didn't get better for us at that time. So we had to work our way out of this. We're in a, we're in a business that has high operating leverage subject to commodity prices. And so the lesson, I've learned and our company has certainly bought into now is to go into this thing with a real strong balance sheet. And that, that allows you to make disciplined investments, do disciplined deals, and survives ups and downs with prices. So what's the, the right level of sort of leverage then for a big 
Well, I like zero. <laughs> I like zero debt, which was where we were in 2011. Uh, first year you had this conference. Mm -hmm. Price of copper was four dollars and thirty cents. Freeport stock was fifty-five plus. Uh, so we were we we had repaid all the debt from the Phelps Dodge deal. That was a deal. Bought a company three times our size. It was leveraged. And then two years later, we went to the financial crisis, and we did all that very well. So commodity prices dropped, copper prices dropped over the next couple of years, but stayed above $3. We did the oil and gas deal in 2013. Uh, a year later, oil prices started deteriorating, then copper prices dropped, and we were left with $20 billion of debt to work our way out from. Uh, we did a great job in 2016 of delevering. We had to sell the Tinky project in Africa that we had started as a greenfield project in 2008. I'm very proud of what we did there. It's an asset we would like to have retained in our portfolio. But when we had to sell assets, it was the one because of Chinese interest in it that we made sense for us to sell. But it wasn't, it was a financial decision to get out, not a strategic decision to get out. Yeah. So, I mean, the message there is the lesson from the last cycle is leverage, um, not to get too highly leveraged. Um, perhaps we can move on then to the new cycle. And Robert, if I could come to you. I mean, we've seen an industry-wide clampdown on spending in the mining industry at the moment. There aren't many big projects coming through, particularly in copper, which is pertinent to both of you. Um, I mean, I just wonder, is, is the industry sort of sowing the seeds for the next boom and bust cycle? As prices go up, people will start to investigate again and splurge on deals and projects. Or do you think there's any chance that the current discipline we're seeing might actually hold? <laughs> well, this is a very long-term industry. Uh, I was born in 1950. I'm a grandfather now. That gives me the time to see these cycles and to get a feeling for what it's like to be in a business that really is engineering, constructing, and launching super tankers that take a long time to turn around, a long time to launch. Uh, behind us, if you could imagine the periodic table, there are about six or seven elements that are going to be a huge winner in the next decade. Uh, and there's a lot of others that are going to bark like a dog. Uh, if you don't want to burn our Arab brothers' oil, and if you believe that uh, diesel engines uh, cause harm to human health in urban environments, then certain elements are winners and others are losers. And it's very clear uh, to those of us that are in the industry, uh, we feel how hard it is to really discover a mine, engineer it, construct it, bring it on stream. Uh, I, I always impolitely say it's like a woman having a 40 kilogram baby. It's very painful. Even a, even a four kilogram baby is bad enough, but you should try building, uh, you know, bringing a, a tier one mine into life, uh, especially under the glare of media attention and quarterly financial statements and very short term financial speculation. It's a, it's a very, very long term process. Uh, and as a consequence, I think uh, early in the next decade, uh, we'll see a, a tremendous appreciation in the price of certain elements. Only a few. Which ones would you? Which ones do you see? Copper, presumably. Well, copper and aluminum win. Aluminum for general light weighting of everything: cars, buses, trains, trucks, and trams, uh, is a big winner vis-a-vis uh, -vis steel. Although steel is fighting back. Uh, copper for electrification of planet Earth, and the reduction of uh, burning hydrocarbon and coal, and uh, nickel. And its, and its cousin, Cobalt, for the electrification of the automobile, buses, trucks, trains, trams, and SUVs. And uh, so nickel and cobalt sort of travel together. Vanadium for grid-scale storage, because uh, you can't really store grid-scale batteries with lithium-ion dependably, because at grid scale, you have to have storage that cannot catch on fire. And that's about it. It's a pretty short list. Uh, to a lesser degree, platinum for fuel cells. Uh, I can't think of a disruptive new use for the barbaric relic gold. Uh, 
And the gnomes of Zurich used to have conferences here for gold. I see a lot more interest in cobalt and copper and nickel today. And I think that's rational. Okay. Let me make a, a point. I'm going to play off something that Andrews talked about this morning when he was talking about the abundance of resources. Um, now, copper faces market risk. I mean, it's tied into the Chinese economy, the global economy. So the risk to the future price of copper at any point in time and long term is on the demand side. Copper is so supported on the supply side. When you look at even what was developed since 2003 um, and then where we stand now with development opportunities, our company is a good example. We produce just under 2 million tons of copper a year. We have 40 million tons of proved and probable reserves and 100 million tons of mineral resources uh, beyond that, just with the mines that we currently own. So you look at those numbers and you would say, what's this big overhang coming to the market? But if the price of copper were to triple today with all these resources, we couldn't bring new production on for eight or 10 years. So Eight or 10 years. And during this time, you know, if the economy grows, if China stays together, our, our existing mines and other mines are going to be shrinking as they've been doing because of declining grades, depleting ore bodies that have to move underground. We're having to move underground with Grassberg now. We're completing mining the pit a year from now. So you have all these things coming together from a supply standpoint, and there's no shell oil for, for copper. It no. cannot be turned on quickly. So, I mean, are we heading for a big supply crunch in copper? I mean, Robert, I think you've said before we will need a telescope to see the price of copper in sort of 10 years' time. I mean, is it going to sort of 10,000 and above? I mean, where do, you, where do you see it heading? The only thing we know for sure about the price is that it'll fluctuate. Uh, I'm, I'm at liberty to talk my book. I mean, sitting on 50 million tons of this stuff, of course I'm going to tell you the price is going up. What would you expect me to do? But um, I might be right. See, the problem is I might be right. <laughs> you know, I mean, all things fluctuate against what? Bitcoin, dollars, Ripple, uh, you know, psychocurrencies or what? I mean, uh, copper is money. Uh, copper has been money for 5,000 years. Uh, copper is money to the Central Bank of China. Uh, in the electrification of the world economy, you just can't get there from here without a copper metal. And uh, I've told you, and I'll say it again, it's a lot harder than you think to find a really large copper mine, uh, one that's really at the bottom of the world cost curve, and to find a sustainable long-term arrangement with local people whose lives are affected by the development of that resource. Uh, we went through that in Mongolia, and we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, the world needs um, probably five or six absolutely tier one copper mines in the next decade to be discovered and brought on stream, and we just don't see them. So, uh, you know, the, the, the copper exists in the earth. There's no doubt. There's copper in the ocean. I mean, there's, there's gold in the ocean, too, at an appropriate price. But I think people who are used to electrons moving at the speed of light have forgotten how long it takes to have a su supply response in response to the price going up. And we're setting ourselves up for a position where uh, copper can really, really appreciate in real terms. Now look, if you bought cobalt a year ago, you'd be up about 350%. It's a very thin market, granted, mm -hmm. but uh, just by buying physical cobalt, you'd, out for, you'd, you'd outperform virtually every fund manager in the world. And it wasn't that hard to see it coming, uh, the electrification of the automobile with the Volkswagen nitrous oxide uh, scandal on cheating on diesel emissions, it was clear that there would be a, 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 an implicit response on a market of only 100,000 tons of metal a year. Nickel is about a 2 million ton a year market, and copper is about a 20 million ton a year market. But these are still relatively thin markets compared to potential demand. OK, um, yeah, Richard. McKenzie says, using modest growth, that there will be a 5 million ton requirement for copper in 10 years. The top 10 copper mines in the world today pr produce less than that. And, and those mines are averaging 100 years old. So it's, it's that. Now, you know, I go back to my original point. 
there, there's not going to be any huge, I, I feel confident saying, there's not going to be huge major upside surprises in supply for copper. And the risk to the market, as we saw in 2014, 15, and 16, has to do with China, which consumes about half the world's copper and the global economy. So the risk is on the demand side, and, but not on the supply side. I mean, how, how do you feel about China and, and the global economy at the moment? Well, you know, um, for most of the super cycle years, we were relying on China for all the growth in the copper markets. Today, the economies around the world are, are growing, some at modest rates, but now over half the growth is coming outside of China. And, and China, with its, uh, you know, every year there's been predictions of China falling apart. I mean, it's been just constant, whether it was the financial sector or other factors, and they have done a remarkable job of keeping their economy together, managing it as growth rates have dropped, but the absolute requirements for metals like copper continues to be very strong. And now with this One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, in countries we can see around the world, China's coming in and investing in infrastructure. We're talking about investing in infrastructure in the United States. So, so the, uh, currently the demand is, is good. There's a lot of scrap in the marketplace, which is helping to balance things. But uh, um, uh, investors are optimistic, just with a big group in Miami, and, and the companies are optimistic. And do we think, uh, I mean, we've got a leader for life potentially now in China. In the uh, United States, or well, no, that's China. Okay. Hopefully not in the United States, but, um, but certainly in China. I mean, does that make um, the outlook for the Chinese economy more stable, given you know, his move to cement power there? I mean, how, how do you see that? Well, I've watched him a good bit. He's an impressive man. And, and yet, you know, I think uh, China, the, the desire of the Chinese population that has developed so much for stability is so strong that I think that stability would have been there in any event. But I think uh, it's a recognition that this guy a, has, has been a, a good leader that's perceived well in China, and he's dealt with issues like uh, corruption and, and environmental issues. So, um, but boy, these people here in the room can predict China's outcome better than me, but we, we do a lot of business there and have had good relationships with Chinese companies. We're obviously concerned about the trade situation. Uh, Do you think we might see a, a tip attack trade war between China and the U.S.? Well, after? we hope not. We hope not. Uh, you know, uh, this administration has a style of stepping out with extreme measures. You know, I think our hopes are, when I say our, I'm talking about the U.S. business community, hopes is that it would lead to a, a resolution of some of the problems that, I, that exist. I mean, they're real trade issues to deal with, uh, but um, that risk on demand, you know, that is a risk on demand that, that it, that, you know, historically swapping tariffs has, is a big, big negative for, 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 for global economies and the hope is that we reach some resolution of these issue, issues short of that. Robert, can I get your observations on China? I mean, are you regular visitors of the country? I mean, you've got a Chinese partner in your big project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so I've lived in China since 1981, and I've heard the annual predictions of its demise. I'd remind everybody here that uh, China is a command economy, and it can continue to be commanded to grow. I see zero chance of a material disruption in China, none. There are, there are two things uh, in China um, that are of paramount importance. One is that the population uh, had a perception about corruption in the ruling party, which is being aggressively addressed, as Mr. Xi says, going after both tigers and flies. And the other is the perception that the air and the water are polluted and the food is polluted and you can't even get baby food that isn't polluted. And, and I think there's a true jihad in China to clean the air and clean the water. And I'm certain uh, that Chinese people will achieve that. Uh, and in conjunction with this Belt and Road, where they'll push their consumer goods out to the world economy, the economic model is to make these TV sets in China cheaper than anywhere in the world, saturate the domestic market, and then 
seldom to Burkina Faso and Pakistan and Iran down that Belt and Road. I think that Belt and Road initiative is probably the most significant thing this audience isn't paying attention to. It's seriously important. Uh, China's already the world leader in solar power. And uh, I, I know of a project northwest of Beijing. It's 60 gigawatts of wind, 60 gigawatts of solar, 60 gigawatts of uh, vanadium redox flow batteries. That's a $150 billion commitment. So when the Chinese do things big, it's really big, like the Three Gorges Dam, uh, the Great Wall of China, uh, the scale at which they're engaging in alternative energy and cleaning their air and the environment, they're the absolute world leader. I think uh, they're on the right track. Uh, of course, there's, a, uh, there's some undercurrents that concern people. But from a commodity perspective, I see no possibility that China will materially slow down for the foreseeable future. None. Uh, you know, they, they've got a reserve currency, and the money that they owe, they owe to themselves. It's, it's a lot like the Japanese. Every time something bad goes on in the world, the Japanese yen gets stronger. Why? They don't even make any more babies in Japan. And the reason is that um, although the Japanese have about $3 trillion of debt, Mrs. Watanabe has about $18 trillion in cash under the mattress. So the, the yen always appreciates. And similarly, uh, in China, they don't, you know, we owe money to China. China doesn't owe money to us. Their debt is to their own people. And so I think it's just silly to think that China's going to collapse. But the closer you get to New York, the more I hear all kinds of dark stories about the demise of China. And the closer you get to Beijing, that just seems laughable and absurd. So I think uh, you'd be better off to bet on copper because the Chinese are going to, you know, everybody's going to get a microwave oven and a washing machine. Uh, everybody's going to have an electric car. Uh, China's going to dominate the world in electric cars. They're already the world's largest car manufacturer. Uh, they're looking at going to 60 million cars a year. of They're at 27 million now. It's just dwarfing the American car industry. And they're going to sell those cars all over the world. Could, can I just touch on that point about China potentially controlling the, the EV revolution? Because, I mean, already, I mean, I mean, thanks to the 10K deal, the mine you sold to the Chinese in the DRC, they own, what, 50% of the, the production deposits in the DRC. Glencore have just done a big deal with them that lists them even further. I mean, it does seem like the Chinese might get a stranglehold over the cobalt market. And if that happens, what does that mean for VW, BMW, Mercedes-Benz when it comes to developing their electric vehicles? Is China going to dominate this market? And it missed out on internal combustion engines, but it's determined this time to lead, you know, play a leading role. Look, uh, um, every t I, I've been in China since 1981, and a lot of the guys I knew just kept on getting promoted, 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 because they were smart guys, because they were well-educated. Because they, uh, and uh, maybe it's a better system. If you take a look at um, the current head of state in the United States, doesn't seem to read anything and gets most of his information from the television. Now, Chinese are, are very careful and long-term thinkers. And they've taken this decision to clean the air and, and lead the world in the electric car. You just have to deal with that reality. Elon Musk is not building the biggest uh, you know, battery factory in the world. The Chinese are building them at five times the scale, six times the scale. And they are looking ahead at what raw materials they require for that industrial revolution. When, um, when Henry Ford uh, figured out how to build a car in 93 minutes, uh, he couldn't build them fast enough. And they were called Model Ts. Any color you want as long as, as, as they're black, remember? Well, the hundreds of car companies came and went. Uh, uh, today, Ford is a sort of second-rate SUV and pickup truck manufacturer with 4% of the market. The guy that made the money was uh, John D. Rockefeller, who figured out that every car needed gasoline. So you can't blame the Chinese for going out and buying up copper and cobalt in the world. You can't fault them for being intelligent. In, in fact, uh, I would advise you to join them. I think you get on that side of that trade. Because <coughs> they must know something you don't. And it's finally filtering down here at the FT Commodities Global Summit in 2018. Well, no, th thank you but, for that. But, but this is not going unnoticed by the Japanese and the other car manufacturers. I mean, they'll be competitors for that yeah, as well. I, they're, yeah, me they're, too, me too. They're smart guys, and, and uh, mm. they, they, you know, they see the future. But uh, so, uh, but 
I agree with Robert. You know, we've, we've had great success in working with the Chinese as opposed to working against them. Okay, um, Richard, before I come on to some questions about Indonesia and Grasberg, just, just one more for Robert. Um, we've got lots of oil traders here in the audience today. Um, going back to your periodic table, you mentioned um, some of the minerals that might, or, or metals or, that might woof. Um, were you referencing oil? Or is there a message you can give sure. to some of the oil I mean, traders in the you room? Know, obviously, there's a degree of pucker factor about oil. If I hold uh, a telephone book out here at the end of my arm, remember those yellow telephone books we used to have when we were younger? I could probably hold it out here for two hours, but at the end of two hours, you put a feather out there, you'd break my arm. So when you implicitly impact the demand for crude oil 10 years out by, if you ever get to 10% of the, of the fleet being electrified, of course it's going to have an impact. Even uh, you know, Mohammed bin Salman is interested in putting money into solar power and alternative energy. So it's a scary trend if you're a crude oil producer. Of course crude oil will still play a very important role for, for decades, for decades. But still, um, the electrification of the world economy is a very real phenomenon. It's being driven by China, whether you like it or not. Uh, and they're engineering it on a scale that is so massive and so real, it's difficult for this audience to believe it unless you've actually seen it. It's hard to explain what it looks like to go to Jambé and see the scale of the wind and solar power they're putting up there. That, that wind blows from Siberia to northern China, and that cold wind has a high energy density. You know, GE is coming out with a new 12 megawatt wind unit that's about the height of the Eiffel Tower. So the scale of these wind units are getting really large, and they consume a lot of copper. And those wind units can just take water with the electricity they generate and generate hydrogen. And they can store the hydrogen in the column of that wind unit, and that hydrogen can also drive a car. And I, I think there's a race. You know, we just have to look at what happened in the last century, that all technologies are accreting, and these changes are, are coming a lot faster. And as rational investors, we have to look forward to see where technology is going. And we have to start thinking about mining the elements in the periodic table that we need to get there from here. If you're green and you want to clean the air, uh, I think miners deserve to have the same P.E. ratio as Tesla, which is infinitely high. Because the company can't exist without certain raw materials. And that's why this conference is so important. What, what really is important to our children or our grandchildren are the kind of metals we mine. We're the good guys. I mean, we're mining copper. We're, that's why I've got a, I've got a copper colored you tie. You touch on, I mean, so, uh, yeah. You touch on valuation there, and, and perhaps I could bring this back to Richard. Um, you look at the mining sector at the moment, it's had a fantastic run over two years, but compared to the wider market, which you may or may not think is, is frothy, miners have never, ever looked cheaper. Yeah. And there seems to be a problem of rebuilding trust with investors after this perception that a lot of money was wasted during the, the sort of downturn. I mean, Richard, how, how does the industry rebuild well, trust? See, I see that as an opportunity. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'd much how do you do it? Be talking to people about why we're undervalued than justifying a high value. So how do we build trust? Hmm. Well, we do what we say we're going to do, and that's, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we, 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 we be transparent with our, our plans, our projects, our resources, our finances, our liquidity, and, uh, and, and then we lay out a process. You know, Robert references, investors are short-term oriented. Yep. And that's just, that's just the way it is. They get judged on shorter term performance measures. Um, and so for a period of time, we've gone to where uh, investors have been stressing on companies to not invest in capital projects, you know, delever, uh, return cash to shareholders and dividends or share buybacks and so forth. And that's dominated the conversation and, you know, I've lived through a couple of generations, surprisingly, I'll say, of CEOs of companies, and I've watched the current CEOs of companies and their board be very reluctant to invest after the experiences yeah. of the past. Now, as we go forward, and I'll just focus on copper, you know, Robert was giving great assurances about China, which I said was one of the risks. You know, that's what leads to the telescope. <laughs> uh, comment that he had about copper prices. But if we move on that trajectory and deficits emerge, then investors, and they're already beginning to do this, 
are going to start saying, where's the growth? Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to start criticizing companies for not investing in growth. What so many people overlook, and you see this, you know, we see it in, uh, in, in a number of the analysts that follow the industry, whether they're with consulting firms or with investment firms, they focus on new projects, but they forget how many of those new projects are replacement projects. You know, we see people include the Grassberg Block Cave development as a new project, a, a new supply, but our pit's going to be gone. Yeah. And so, you know, you look at the projects that Cadelco's doing, they're replacement projects. And even to some extent, our big expansion that was so successful at Cerro Verde in Peru was done, it added, we tripled our production, but if we hadn't done that, our existing production would have fallen off dramatically. So uh, we have to think longer term. We are doing a lot of work because we do have a whole series of low risk brownfield expansions that don't have the same permitting issues, don't have the same community issues, uh, don't have the same infrastructure development challenges. And so we're going to be prepared to move forward to those. And yet, it's not going to be something you just turn on a spigot and all yeah. of a sudden there's, there's a huge supply. But, uh, but you know, that's, that's, that's going to be our future. And I think that's one of the, that is a real asset of our company that will become apparent as these developers, the, uh, deficits that I expect develop. Okay, um, I mean, you touched on projects there, both of you. Um, perhaps we could just talk about... Um, a couple of your projects. I mean, Robert, first of all, you're building um, a copper deposit in the DRC, which has been called the most important find in human history by analysts at Bernstein. Um, this is the, 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 uh, the, the Kakula Kamoa project. Um, but, obviously in the, but obviously, in the DRC, there are challenges in operating there, and we're seeing that at the moment with the, the mining code. Um, I mean, if I could just ask about the DRC Mining Co. President Kabila. Um, I mean, are you prepared to walk away from this project if the code isn't revised? I mean, I think there have been some vague undertakings that he might consider everyone's concerns about this. But, um, I mean, how is it, it going to play out, do you think? Don't be such a silly boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to walk away then. <laughs> Look, um, Africa. Uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is larger than Europe. Uh, it came out of a colonial period where it was the personal plaything of the King of Belgium. Quite a rough history. If you came from Mars in a flying saucer made out of green cheese and your masters in Mars sent you to planet Earth to look for that particular element in the periodic table called copper, the first place you'd go to is Katanga in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was, after all, the world's largest producing region of copper until the 1970s. Bigger than Chile. And it'll get there again. And uh, I'm always astonished at how little the media really understands about our industry or about Africa in general. First of all, um, I first went to the Congo in 1997 when Laurent Desiree Kabila, the father of the current president, um, became the president of the country. And the improvements that I've seen in the urban environment uh, since the late 1990s are really very dramatic. And a lot of those improvements came from Chinese bilateral assistance. But uh, people are better dressed. There's better food. Uh, there's a much more virulent press. NGOs are there. It doesn't look like a bombed out war zone. And uh, a lot of people have called for the president to resign. But the current president caused a period of stability for about, uh, for about 12 years, where our industry was able to invest about $11 billion yeah. and uh, to dramatically improve the GDP of the country. And I see a younger generation of young Congolese that are just as smart or perhaps smarter than anybody in this room. Last night I had uh, dinner with a young Congolese, 29 years old, getting his doctorate, speaks fluent Chinese. I'm trying to hire him. But um, the, uh, the current president has, uh, here's the news, guys, 
has agreed to an election on the 23rd of December this year. We've heard that prime, before, though, no, in agreeing to elections. No, 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 no. No, as Prime Minister has confirmed it, it's not that easy to have an election in a country larger than Europe with a lot of, uh, a lot of differentiation in linguistic groups, ethnic groups. Perhaps it never should have been a country. It, it came out of a colonial heritage. But you've got radically different languages. It's a very big country. It's a tough thing to manage. 47 million people have been registered to vote electronically. The Canadian government has spent $40 million uh, training ele election observers. So, you know, we, we got rid of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, and it didn't look too good in Libya. We got rid of the Shah of Iran. I'm not sure that was so good. The media beats up on who's ever in power without really thinking it through carefully. If Joe Kabila uh, oversees democratic elections, we'll look back at him having done a fantastic job for his country. So uh, I believe there's going to be an election. I think it's going to be democratic. Uh, I just faced a wall of television cameras with our, our fellow miners. And, and the fact is that there is now an election season. And in every country, uh, people are nationalistic about their their natural resources and their wealth. You know, that 2002 law pays the Congolese people 2% of the medal. Two. It's probably the lowest NSR that almost any net smelter royalty than any government collects. And so we've publicly said uh, that we're, we're willing to countenance higher royalties as long as, in a, in a very transparent manner, they help the local people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't negotiate in public. Uh, a lot of people do. A lot of people with an ax to grind run to their local representative of the third estate and make all kinds of comments because they want to negotiate in the media. We've learned that's not the game to play. I, I would say the Congo would be re-rated in the future upwards. I think there will be a democratic election. I think capital will flow there, not only from China, I might add, uh, even from the major mining companies, because we're like bees going to honey. We have, we have to go to where the metals are, and we have to find a sustainable way uh, to mine those metals where there's a buy-in from the local people, where there's, where there's a, a relationship that works. Now, in its, in its best day, I don't think OPEC ever achieved more than about 50% control in the world's crude oil. In its best day. Um, I doubt they even got there. The Congo uh, is producing about 70% of the world's cobalt. 70% of the world's cobalt. Now, there's cobalt in the rest of the world. Uh, and my experience has been that when you have an election period, governments are always nationalistic and want a bigger piece of the pie. C'est normal, n'est-ce pas? And then after the election, when the new guy comes in, he wants to go around on a tour with Goldman Sachs and Stanley Morgan and attract money to come back to his country. Yeah. It's a natural cycle. So you'll see the other side of this noise as soon as there's a new administration begging all of you in Zurich, and they'll try to coax all the gold out of the streets of the Bahnhofstrasse. Um, Come back to the Congo. You mentioned looming elections. Another place where elections are coming in is, is Indonesia, where you, Freeport owns the Grasberg mine, the world's second biggest copper mine. Um, I mean, there's been lots of uh, sort of debate, I guess, with the government there. You've agreed to sell 51% of that mine to... Um, local interests. Richard, I mean, is, I mean, how is that process going? Are we moving towards a resolution there that will allow you to then push ahead with this very big investment project in the, uh, in the underground expansion at Grasberg? Yeah, I believe we are. Uh, the <clears throat> framework agreement, which included an agreement for us to uh, divest so that Indonesia is known 51%, uh, was part of a package deal. And the package included that any divestment would be at fair market value by international standards, that it would be in a structure that would allow Freeport to continue to manage the business, that we would get an approval of an extension of our operations to 2041 with stabilized fiscal and legal terms that could not be changed by subsequent laws and regulations. So, that was our attempt to be uh, responsive yeah. to the aspirations of the government of Indonesia and protect the interests of our shareholders. This is a fabulous resource. I mean, it's a resource that over the next 
20 plus years will produce uh, you know, a billion and a half pounds of copper a year, a million and a half ounces of gold uh, with costs that will be on the order of 50 cents a pound at today's gold prices. Besides being the world's second or third largest copper mine, it's the world's largest gold mine because it has uh, such a strong byproduct content of gold and the resources. So, you know, uh, uh, we're working amicably with the government. They are facing a presidential election in 2019 regional elections this year, and that's, you know, that's always a complication. The, there's also discussions going on with our joint venture partner and the government about uh, potentially uh, the government acquiring their interest. So, uh, but we, we made a lot of progress over the last six months. And finally, uh, have a process going uh, of where we're working towards an agreed mutual resolution. So we could see something this year, do you think? You'll see something this year. I hope it's, uh, <laughs> I hope it's a final resolution, uh, but okay. we will see something. Okay, well, we're just running short on time. I think we can probably take one question from the audience if um, anyone would like to ask Robert or Richard anything. Um, if you could raise your hand, uh, if you've got a question at all. Well, I think they've probably answered all of your I, I queries. I would just say the question you asked Robert about Leaving the Congo, people were asking us the same thing in 2008, mm -hmm. 2009, when we went through the last situation of uh, negotiations, and we were able to find a, a, a mutually acceptable resolution at that time. Okay, well, as I said, we have, uh, we have run short on time, so I'd just like to thank Robert Freeland and, and Richard Ackerson for a very stimulating debate. Thank you very much. Thank you.